we are at lesson nine, the new man in our foundation Bible class. Uh, let us commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank Thee and pray that Thou, by Thy Spirit, come and guide us and bless our understanding. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. The new man, the new birth, brings forth the new man. A spiritual man living on a new plane, touching on the divine. A man of faith in God through Christ is a technical description. The word new means of a new kind. Unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. This is the word the Apostle Paul used to describe his new life in Christ. Whereas before he was a blasphemer of Christ and his followers persecuting the church after his conversion, he was her chief advocate. A complete change and turnaround. The Apostle Paul described the new man as a most precious possession of God, chosen by the Father before the world was ever created to be a child of God, purchased by the Son unto holiness for sweet fellowship with God, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit to a most splendid, unimaginable, and undefiled heavenly inheritance. Ephesians 1, verse 7, verse 4, verse 7, and verse 13. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, in whom also ye trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory." To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, God reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God gives to him a new nature, a new, a changed nature as a result of the new birth. He becomes a child of God having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. The word adoption means the placing as a son. It speaks of our position in the sight of God. We are called the children of God, being accorded the privileges and responsibilities of that position. 1 John 3 verse 1 to 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The new nature is holy in character, pure and undefiled, reflecting the holiness of our Heavenly Father. We shall enjoy the heavenly inheritance accorded to us by God through Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 10 to 11 says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him 
who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And the sign of our adoption is that we are led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So a man who is uh, received a new birth, uh, the new man, the spiritual man, uh, is one who is led by the Holy Spirit. We become the members of God's spiritual family. And now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The new man, first of all, is a man of faith. It is by faith in the truth of the gospel that effect the new birth. Just as life comes to a new physical uh, a person physically, a gift, gift, the gift of God is given uh, a man spiritual life. Uh, this also comes from God. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This faith is not innate in an unregenerate man, the old man, but the gift of God, supernaturally given. The emphasis of its divine origin is evident in the literal translation of God the gift. Ye receive the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. And why did God choose to save us? It pleased Him, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. That by His grace, the unmerited favour of God, we are restored to properly reflect the image of God in us, punished as a result of sin. We could not, by any means of our merits, attain to this blessed state of fellowship with God. Not of works. In other words, nothing in ourselves could bring forth this salvation. It is all of Christ, by His finished work in His life, death, resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Christ takes the penalty of our sins unto Himself and gives to us in return His righteousness. All of these are effected by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 to 21 says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's state that be reconciled to God, for He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, we are counted righteous, to be right with God, justified before God by faith. And this faith that God, first gives us, will tarry with us till we are conducted by His power all the way to heaven. Romans 1 verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Thus, we are a new spiritual being. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. As such, the old life of sin and its misery is now a thing of the past. We are a new man in Christ, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are created unto Christ Jesus unto good works to bear forth the attributes of God in the new life. Matthew 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The new man is a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the Master's use and prepared for every good work. 2 Timothy 2 
verse 19 and 20. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honour, some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So the man is secondly a man of holiness. He says no to sin, having been made clean, he abhors uncleanness. So here we see that a, a vessel that is sanctified unto honour, meet for the master's use, is one who says no to sin. Having been made clean, he abhors uncleanness. My son, Solomon says in Proverbs 1 verse 10, If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. As we said earlier, the new nature is holy in character, pure and undefiled, reflecting the holiness of our Heavenly Father. Matthew 5 verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Where he sins, he sought the Lord for forgiveness. 1 John 1 verse 8 to 10, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. His daily confession, the new man, uh, uh, would be, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The demeanour of such a man is firstly a poverty of spirit. Secondly, a mourning for sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. There is a holy inclination towards the things of God, a pleasure to do the will of God. This new character is called meekness. He fulfills the purpose for which he is created. God accords for him a place of existence and testimony upon earth to bring glory to God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek has an inclination to love and obey the commandments of God. Psalm 119 verse 17 says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And uh, he's also a man in sweet fellowship, in sweet fellowship with God. The meek man has that inclination. The new man lives in praise and communion with God in private and public worship, freed from the bondage of sin, he is. He enjoys the beauty of holiness and blessed fellowship with the Godhead. Psalm 104, verse 33 to 34 says, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of Him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Psalm 29, verse 1 to 2, Psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. There is a sweetness of life that comes through that communion that is effected by meditation through God's, upon God's word through prayer. His life is lived to bring glory to God. There is a newfound love to be in the house of God, to worship Him on the Lord's day, and a desire to fellowship with Him in corporate prayer with God's people. The psalmist described well this deep desire for fellowship with God through worship. He says, How amicable, or how lovely are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Psalm 84, verse 1 to 4. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts. 
my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still, they will be still praising thee, Silla. He finds himself fully satisfied with communion with God, dwelling with him in his house. Psalm 84 verse 10, For a day in thy courts, he testified, is better than a thousand. I had rather to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Fourthly, he is a man of insatiable appetite for God's word, a hungering after righteousness. The new man finds a persevering strength to enjoy the blessings that comes from God when he goes after God. Psalm 63 verse 8 says, My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Jesus described it well. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's a great desire and appetite to be constantly immersed in the meditation and study of God's word. For therein our spiritual being is nourished and strengthened. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 1 to 40, where he speaks of the blessedness of embracing God's word, showing us the cleansing, <coughs> the counseling, the strengthening, the establishing, and the power of God's word. Verse 9 to 16, verse 17 to 24, verse 25 to 32, and verse 33 to 40. And here, uh, the Lord uh, seeks for us to know Him and follow Him. The word, the word of God cleanses the soul. The defilement of sin in a believer's life can be cleansed. <coughs> the secret is in the believer's quiet time. The psalmist says, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Not only is God's word a cleansing power for the young men, it does the same for the old. The believer's quiet time is private devotion time, set aside for the purpose of cultivating a rich spiritual life. It is an appointment with God. So the believer's quiet time seeks to move him or her from a state of stress to a state of rest. So we need to cultivate that that time with God. Every day, we must spend time with God uh, so that we would receive wisdom from God, the cultivation of a calm spirit in the peace and joy of God is the frame of a man touched, in touch with God. The believer's quiet time is the high point of private worship. The elements of private devotion are prayer, reading, meditation of God's word, singing of hymns. He considers God's word as true riches. What is God's message for me today? Do you have a message for God every day? Do you, have a, do you ask this question? God, what is it that you want me to do today? The quiet time must not deteriorate into a thoughtless routine. It must not take away the excitement and delight of the soul in the pursuit of God. Yet there is a need to have a self-discipline to cultivate the habit of lifelong devotion to God. When we hide the word of God in our hearts, it has a sanctifying effect in the believer. Therefore, it encourages us to rejoice, meditate, and delight in God's Word. The cleansing power of God's Word must be experienced. And there is a persevering desire to know God and experience Him personally, a desire to trust and obey the laws of God. Teach me, O Lord, is the psalmist's prayer. O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Fifthly, he is a man of understanding. The new man is a man of understanding. The wisdom of God fills his heart and soul, endows him with the skill for this new life. Psalm Ephesians 1 verse 8 and 9 says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. We see, dear friends, that life is purposeful. Fulfilling the will of God. As the new man meditates upon God's word, there's a sanctifying effect, granting him wisdom and prudence, um, prudence, moral insight for life. Proverbs 1 verse 2 to 7, uh, Solomon tells us, To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, 
to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young men knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He learns the fear of God. He learns the, that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, the application of knowledge. Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. He learns to fear God and be wary of himself. He understands that he is a sinner saved by grace. When he is not vigilant, he can fall. Sixthly, the new man's blessing. What is the blessing of walking with God? A man of wisdom, we say. Well, uh, firstly, Paul in Romans 5 verse 1 says that he has peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The first blessing, being a child of God, is peace with God. This is the first of seven blessings delineated in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, for every child of God. There is no more enmity but reconciliation with God, a reconciliation that comes because man's sin has been fully dealt with by Christ's death on the cross. Colossians 1, verse 20 to 21. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they being be things in earth, of things on, in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. God's wrath is averted. Friendship and goodwill with God restored. This is the powerful consequence of what faith in Christ brings for the sinner. He is translated from one consigned to hell to one bound for heaven. In our daily life, when we do wrong, our conscience will give us no peace until we set right the matter. This peace comes as a result of sins forgiven. Peace comes to our heart. This peace is a quiet rest, a sense of quiet rest in the heart. There is no longer a guilty conscience. This is what God does to our heart when we repent of our sins and put on the righteousness of Christ. Peace comes to our heart. A peace that God supernaturally bestows to a, the reconciled sinner. Every born-again Christian experiences this peace. May the experience of this peace in our hearts give us great boldness to proclaim the gospel as a testimony to the saving grace of God. Secondly, we have access to God's favour. Romans 5 verse 2 a says, By whom also we have by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Our salvation in Christ brings to us access to God's unfailing and inexhaustible favour. This blessing of God's grace is appropriated by faith. And this blessed standing before God begins when we become a child of God and continues forever. It is mind-boggling as we are brought to the realisation of this great privilege that we have in Christ. This access for the believer is by way of prayer to the Father in heaven in the name of Jesus Christ. When we have any need, we can call to the Father in heaven to supply. And He hearkens to our cry each time. The psalmist testified how he loved his Lord, who has been a ready helper for him. Psalm 116 verse 1 to 10 tells us, I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice and my supplication, because He hath inclined His ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me. The death of the pains of hell get hold upon me. I love trouble and sorrow. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the Lord, the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Grace, gracious is the Lord, 
and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and He helped me. Return unto my rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. Truly, we have a great God in Jesus Christ, whom we can through life's pathway. Have you any need? Do you take time to call upon God? Thirdly, the third blessing, hope of the glory of God. Romans 5 verse 2, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The child of God is confident of his good standing before God through Jesus Christ. He has assurance in his heart that God will always do him good. As Solomon says, testified in Proverbs 10 verse 22, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow to it. The, riches, the richness of spiritual blessings in Christ is to be experienced on earth, here and now. But the best is yet to come. The splendor and beauty of blessings in heaven cannot be fully comprehended. When we travel to different places, we marvel at the beauty of God's creation. This will pale to the glories of heaven. God would give us a supernatural body to enjoy the perfect splendor of heaven in eternity. We cannot fully fathom this great privilege now. We catch a glimpse of it through the eyes of Scripture. and This is the third blessing of being a child of God. Greater blessing is yet future. And this is our sure hope. The hymn, Saved by Grace, uh, uh, rightly it gives us that sense. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing, but oh the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face to tell the story saved by grace. I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. May the meditation upon this third blessing bring great encouragement for us to press on in life. Fourthly, glory in tribulation. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. The fourth blessing of being a child of God is that we can face trials in life with courage and strength, being assured that we are not struggling alone, but God is with us. Jesus gives these words of encouragement to His disciples before He went to the cross. In John 16 verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. The word tribulation means to be pressed to a breaking point. Dear friends, the new man uh, in a darkened world uh, will be pressed to a breaking point. The trials in the believer's life can be so overwhelming, but Jesus assured his disciples to take courage and be confident and rest in the truth that He is with them to help them overcome and have victory. Therefore, in the believer's heart, there is peace, a quiet confidence that Christ will yet help him to triumph. There's an interesting illustration called two pictures that help illustrate the restfulness of peace that Jesus gives to His people. Two painters each painted a picture to illustrate the concept of rest. The first chose for a scene a still lone lake among far-off mountains. But the second threw on his canvas a thundering waterfall. Imagine the thundering waterfall. Then you would see a fragile big tree bending over the foam of the waterfall. At the fork of the branch, almost wet with the cataract spray, is a robin, a little bird that sat on its nest. The first was only stagnation. The last was rest, says the writer. For in rest, there are two elements, tranquility and energy, silence and turbulence, creation and destruction, fearfulness and fearlessness. Right? The Lord helps us to see this. The believer is able to glory in tribulation. Not to not be afraid of trials and not buckle under its pressure, 
because God's assured help is given to the children, to His children. Tribulation produces steadfast endurance. Romans 5 verse 3b says, Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In the Christian's life, we are expected we expect tribulation to come. Trouble, sufferings, tears, affliction and distresses are part of this earthly life. We cannot avoid it. It is allowed by God in His sovereign will to mould us that it may bring forth godly virtues. And one of the fruits of tribulation is that it produces the fruit of patience. Patience. Tribulation builds Christian character. We do not welcome tribulation, humanly speaking, as we think of the emotion, the, the emotional, the mental, the physical suffering that it brings. Often we shudder. We look at the life of those who went through tribulation. We acknowledge it's tough going. The word patience describes a bearing under, a patience of endurance to things or circumstances that seem overbearing. It can mean a prolonged sickness, having to care for a loved one who is not well, a loss of job, a harsh working conditions. While we are under those circumstances, we struggle. The Christian value of patience describes perseverance, of steadfast endurance, not giving up in adversity. The book of Psalms is the Bible's prayer book. It describes the many struggles of the psalmist through the vicissitudes of life how he overcame and had victory through these prolonged hours of tribulation is meaningful study. So for us to understand and know how to have strength to go through tribulation, let's read the Psalms. The overarching lesson is to trust God, though there seem to be no light at the end of the tunnel. And this is a chorus for our encouragement. Only Jesus, only Jesus, only He can satisfy all my burdens are turned to blessings when I know my Lord is nigh. If you are going through some affliction, may this chorus encourage your heart to keep trusting God. God's love shed abroad in our hearts, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. The believer who trusted in the faithfulness and goodness of God and experienced it has an experiential knowledge of God. He gains confidence and hope in God. He knows God does not disappoint. He will trust God and call upon Him, making it a lifelong habit. He moves from a maturing to a matured faith. We can always hope in God all the days of our life and experience His care and protection. The fifth blessing is the gift of God's love. Paul tells us, the reason for our hope in God is because of God's unfailing love. This pure love is first shed abroad, being poured out in the heart of every believer by the Holy Spirit at conversion. This love is like an injection given that goes directly to the bloodstream, producing its effect. We have to acknowledge the divine nature of this love and the divine source of this love. This love enables us to experience the warmth of God's presence and enables us to share it with others unconditionally and sacrificially. God's love manifested in a believer's life is like a well of water flowing out into everlasting life. The woman at the well in Samaria experienced it. She was so happy. She was seeking for true love, but did not find it in her relationship with five husbands. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did, and when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, and he would tarry with them, and he abode with them two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. She witnessed to others in Samaria, and they believed, and Jesus witnessed to yet others, and more came to trust Christ, the Saviour of the world. Assurance of God's preservation. Verse 10 of Romans 5 says, For if, for if when we were 
enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. This sixth blessing of being a child of God is God's preservation in this present life and forevermore. After Christ's resurrection from the dead, He appears to His disciples for 40 days before He ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. In heaven, Christ functioned as intercessor. Hebrews 1 verse 3, And when He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. But this man, Hebrews 7 verse 24 to 25 says, Because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. By the intercessory prayer of Christ, we are kept forevermore. This is the privilege of God's child, or being God's child. How does our Lord Jesus Christ carry on this work? How shall we comprehend and grasp what is the meaning of Christ's intercession? Uh, we, <clears throat> we see this when we consider Hebrews 7 verse 25. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He never liveth to make intercession for them. It tells of the nature of that continual intercession which Christ ever lives to make on our behalf, His believing people. In ancient, in ancient Israel, the Levitical priests had to succeed one another because they kept dying. As one generation comes, another goes. <coughs> Excuse me. Time and tide waits for no man. But Jesus Christ needs no successor because He will not die. The fact that Christ will not die and need replacement by another priest means that he can see his work of delivering his people through to the end. He will not fail us. He will save us to the uttermost. His grace is sufficient. Life is tough. We are called to go through many difficulties in this life to heaven. Despite the difficulties, He will see us through. He will see you through. Our trials and temptations will not separate us from our eternal inheritance since Jesus Christ can continually support us by providing mercy and grace all the way to our ultimate reward. What a comfort and assurance it is to realize that Jesus Christ Himself is praying for us constantly. The seventh blessing of being a child of God is joy in God. Finding joy in God, Romans 5 verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through Jesus Christ, by whom also we receive the atonement. It describes an attitude of confidence in God, to rejoice, glory in, boast in the stability of life with God. The psalmist testified of this joy in God as he made God the center of his devotion in Psalm 16 verse 5 to 11. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have goodly, a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there, is ple there are pleasures forevermore. Life with God dispels fear and anxiety. We can trust in His care, provision and protection. When we are unable to rejoice in our circumstance, we can rejoice in the Lord under those circumstances. We can rest in His love and meditate upon His goodness. It brings strength to our soul. This joy is not the fleshly happiness of the world, going to the parties, eating a good meal, buying a new car, striving for a promotion, getting a pay increase. Notice this world that we live in goes for entertainment and thought that it is joy to be entertained for two hours in a comedy, in a movie. We thought that is joy. But biblical joy is not the entertainment kind of happiness. We live in this era of 
television, big screen, entertainment and the YouTube. People who do not have true joy goes for entertainment. They look for a substitute. It's not a lasting substitute. Even the church today has caught the entertainment bug. Worship services are trans transformed into mega entertainment shows. Entertainment began with as silent movies in the pre-war era and came as an escape for the troubles in times of war and economic depression. It seeks to replace the living and true God, Jesus Christ, the source of true joy in America, a Christian nation. Remember Charlie Chaplin, the English comic actor and director of silent films, 16th April 1889 to 25th December 1977. It's interesting how the silent movies were termed the American Tower of Babel that gels the migrants coming to America speaking different languages. Inadvertently, it provides an escape from confronting a life without knowing the living and true God and the true state of our depravity. In 2008, Martin Seif, in a review of the book Chaplin, A Life, wrote, Chaplin was not just big, he was gigantic. In 1915, he burst into a war-torn world, bringing it the gift of comedy, laughter, relief, while it was tearing itself apart through the First World War. Over the next 25 years, through the Great Depression and the rise of Hitler, he stayed on the job. It is doubtful any individual has ever given more entertainment, pleasure and relief to so many human beings when they needed it most. Alas, this temporal escape inevitably result in a hangover like the intoxication of liquor. Problems still not solved after that. Thank God for giving us true joy in God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Seventh, a new, the new man is grateful. Romans 5 verse 7 to 8 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded in the his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross surpassed all human reasoning and leads us to understand the truth that God loves us. For a man to sacrifice himself to save good men and righteous men in, is understandable. But for Christ to sacrifice himself for criminals like the thief that hung on the cross beside him is difficult to comprehend. He deserved to be punished for the crime that he committed. Luke 23, verse 32 to 33. And there was also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Luke 23, verse 39 to 43. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doth not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me, in paradise. The most difficult, the worst of criminals by the grace of God can be saved. It is demonstrated that the gospel is not of this world, but is of the heavenly realm. God gives his approval by his enduring love to save when even the worst sinners demonstrate the sacred nature of God's love. It bewilders the human mind and leads the believer to bow in humble worship and adoration to our great God. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for granting us understanding of Thy Holy Word to comprehend the new man that is in Christ. Lord, we praise Thee for it is indeed Thy work, the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We thank Thee for the words of the scripture that help us to understand the nature of this new man and we rejoice and praise thee for what thou hast done in and through us through thy spirit for thy own honor and glory strengthen thy people this i pray with thanksgiving 
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.